continuing into some, you know, action order A type stuff, child care. How many of you have child care challenges on your installation? Tracking, tracking. We know child care is an issue. We've got some, some very passionate folks within our A1S services area that's, that's looking at some different and creative ways to get after child care. Because I go back to, and this is the, the negative piece, right, when I talk about that, and you heard from, I go back to Jeremiah Ross briefing from the A yesterday, is this is not something that we can milk on out of, right? We have, three, I think, three projects for CDCs in the Air Force, three. So we've got to figure out creative ways to get after child care. And there are some things that are out there, right? You've got child care coordinators on the installation. What I would do is I would use, and, and Mac mentioned this this morning, your FSS superintendent, your MPF superintendent. Those individuals need to be near and dear to you. And I mean that because taking care of airmen and taking care of families falls in that lane, falls in the force support squadron. Child and youth programs falls in the force support squadron. And so understanding the dilemma on your base, and when I ask the question about how many of you had child care challenges on your installation, what your challenge is is different than your challenge and different than your challenge. And, and so the point in that is there's not a one-size-fits-all that gets after child care. Somebody mentioned to me the other day is, why don't we make it an AFSC? I, I think that's a great idea. However, what I will tell you is that goes against action order D in design, right? Where we're looking at the 117 AFSCs that we already have and figuring out if we can have less, right? And so to create another one that now we bring folks into BMT and tech training to do CDC work, I don't know that we're going to get there. I honestly thought it wasn't a bad idea, right? But I don't know that that can survive, you know, coming through the Pentagon. And so we've got to figure out creative ways. There are some bases that in the past have done things where they've had challenges with CDCs and they've opened it up to, you know, volunteers for, you know, airmen that are on swing shift. But they, during the day, they come spend some time with, with children because they had specific challenges at their installation. That's also not a bad idea. However, what I will tell you is when we talk about CDCs, when we talk about CDC employment, when we talk about certifications, we put a lot of effort into certifying our child and youth program leaders, right? So it's not just, we're not, we're not getting babysitters off the street, right? These are child development program individuals, right? There, there's a lot of money and invested time into training them. And so I always caution folks before you just let Airman, you know, Jones, watch your kid, you know, I just, I caution people on that. It's okay for a temporary time frame, right, if that's something that the installation commander wanted to accept, you know, risk on, but I think we are accepting risk by doing that, right? Some of you don't even let your in-laws or your, you know, brother or sister watch your kids. You're very particular about who watches your kids, and so just know we've got some of the best training offered in the world when it comes to child and youth programs, and that's part of the challenge. Is why? Because much like some of you know, your airmen in AFSCs that are marketable on the outside, what do they do? They leave, right? And so, and, and I go back to the challenge at your base is different than the challenge at that base, which is different than the challenge at the third base, is because some of you don't have capacity, right? That's a challenge. Some of you don't have workers. That's a challenge, right? But those are two different issues. And then some of you are in HP Con Charlie. That's also a challenge. Because now when the CDC room leader, if a child gets COVID, right, then all those people in that room are, are what? Close contacts. So now we've lost a provider and we've got 20 kids that can't come back to the CDC for five days. So now that creates a challenge for you at home and your members at home, because now I can't even take my kid to the CDC. And so we're, we're, we're working through that is really what I'm getting at. And that's why I don't want to ignore the fact that 
that CDCs, there's some challenges. We are working on things. There are things that installation commanders have the authority to do, right, when it comes to salaries and wages, hourly wages of our CDC employees, so on and so forth. Uh, what I will tell you is over this past, this past summer, downtown child development centers were paying people to come in for an interview. It wasn't a sign-on bonus. It was a come sit and talk with this bonus. And then we're going to try to convince you to work here. We face those same challenges. We do. Because how many of you have kids? OK. I have two. And when they were four and one, they were two of the grossest human beings I'd ever met. <laughs> and I'm asking someone to do this for a living during COVID. It's hard is really what I'm getting at. Right? That doesn't mean we stop trying to figure out how to get after it. But my point is, is, is we understand that there's a challenge. We understand that there's a weight right, at the CDC. We understand all of those things. And so I ask you, you know, figure out at your installation what the issue is, because it's not the same everywhere. It's really not. And so we're going to continue to get after CDCs and figure out what we can do to, to make it a little bit easier. But I will tell you, there's some websites on some of these slides. DaftChildAndYouth.com is a great website to go to, right? And so just pay attention to that, and, and they're all, always putting good stuff out there. So we talked a little bit about modernizing IT platforms. Here's what's going to happen in the future. Chief McElroy talked about 118 programs. Just to give you for context, right? And I'm not an IT guy. I've told you that before last hour, right? But there's, there's a number, right, that IT programs, and if you're an IT person in here, don't tell me if my number's wrong, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm using this as an example, right? I think that number is 60, right? And so each program, in order for it to be effective, right, and, and labeled as a good IT program, 60 is kind of the cut line, right? 60 is the cut line. AFIPS 2 was like an 18. Right? So when we talk about IT transformation, we had a huge need to transform our IT. And also, too, you have to go to take leave. You go here. To go get a, a printout of your decorations, you go here. To figure out where you want to go to you know, get a certification, you have to go here. Here's what you need to tell your formations, and here's what you need to know. Go to MyFSS, right? Go to MyFSS. Somebody emailed me this morning and said, hey, where can I find my eval? It's under MyFSS. My eval's under MyFSS. My fitness is under MyFSS. AFIPS eventually, when it comes online, is going to be under MyFSS. My vector is under MyFSS. So all you have to do, it's two simple steps. Go to the portal, right? Search my FSS. It's all going to be right there. That's part of the IT transformation as well, is putting them all in one area. Right? But we had a lot of programs, as Mac mentioned this morning, that quite frankly just were old. And we've got to modernize a little bit. Here's this slide. I'm going to be honest with you. This isn't my slide. I use it because it's part of my, my boss's brief. Uh, we are going to change this slide. But there are things that are stacked on top of each other, and that's kind of what Mac was talking about, the daisy chain this morning, the bottom line is we've got to modernize our IT platforms. How long have we been using LeaveWeb? Some of you don't even know what it's like to fill out a 988 with a pen. Some of you didn't even know it was called a 988, if you're being honest with yourself, right? Because you came in during LeaveWeb, right? Those, those of us that are a little more seasoned in the room know what it was like to fill out a you know, four-page right, carbon copy. You had to print really hard. Right? And you'd send it up, and you'd get copy three. Two weeks after you got back from leave, copy three would come through your distro. Right? Now it's all digital. But even, even leave web. Right? We've got to look at all the platforms that we have in our Air Force and, and modernize them. Right? There's some of the IT initiatives I talked about, my FSS, my fitness, my eval, all of those things are either here or they're coming in the future. So understand 
understand MyFSS and kind of everything is, is underneath that. And so go check that out if you haven't been to MyFSS. If you haven't been to MyVector, go check it out. A lot of goodness out there. A lot of goodness. Disparity reviews, right? I talked about the September 20 RDR or December of 20 RDR. Talked about the DR in September of this year. Talked about the addendum, right? There were some issues identified in all of them. So we've taken the RDR, we've taken the DR, we've laid it on top of each other, and then what has you know, been able to be seen through was common to both of them, right? Common to both of them, and that's the, that's the addendum, right? And there were some, some issues, right? Promotions from, from E5 to E7 on the enlisted side, 04 to 06 on the officer side, right? Different challenges. I will tell you, this is a holistic challenge, right? And we've got to have holistic changes, right? A whole of Air Force change when you're talking about this. Why? Because when you talk about representation at the rank of chief, but you start down here with a lower than representation in society, you're not going to get to where you want to up here, right? And so that's why it's, and this isn't us saying, hey, it's recruiting. That's part of it. But it's also opportunities given throughout the Air Force, right? And so when you're a master sergeant, you're given those opportunities to make senior and to make chief. And then we have representation. We've got, we've got issues with representation. We've got issues with promotions, right, and all of those things. And so we had to, had to figure that out. This slide, I know you can't see the yellow, but here's really what, what we're looking at. And there's different things that are important on this slide. So the big red circle is representation. Where we are, we are not where we need to be on representation, right? So in other words, we're lower on Asian, Asian officer females. We're lower overall on Native Americans. We're lower on you know, Hispanic and Latino males, right? Why is that important? Because when you talk about retention, right, we're lower on Asian males, Pacific Islanders, and white females. And so how does that tie in to promotion? Well, if you start out low on representation, just like I said, and they're not staying, then of course, promotion ties into that to the higher grades. But that also could be why they're leaving. So we've got to look at this you know, from a holistic approach and figure out what, what's, what's doing, uh, what's causing that. And so we have, I will tell you, one of the things that, uh, you know, we partner a lot with our DNI teammates, right, ODI, diversity and inclusion. When it comes to AFIs, we had a uniform board back in, gosh, was that November of 20? Seems like a long time ago. November of 20. Long hair, right? Ponytails, braids. And so all of those things, and this is what I want you to think about, is we've got, we've got working groups, right, at the secretariat level that are looking at this stuff, right? The, the WIT, right? The Women's Initiative Team. You know, think about the things that they can do, right, that will get after some of this stuff. And so we, is there six or seven, SimSAF? Six, yeah, there's six BOGs, right, Barrier Analysis Working Group. Your career fields have done barrier analysis work, right, and figured out what, uh, what barriers are keeping people. And one of the career fields, I'll give you this an example, is one of the career fields for years has said that everybody needs to be able to lift, lift 75 pounds over their head. But when you talk about what they do in that job with the CFM, do they need to lift 75 pounds over their head? And so they were lower on females in their career field. And so is, is lifting 75 pounds over your head, is that a barrier to getting more females in the Air Force? I don't know. 75 pounds over your head seems like a lot in any job. But some career fields may require that, but others don't. And so all the CFMs did barrier analysis within their career fields and figured out were there qualifications that were keeping people from coming into that career field because all of that ties into the retention piece and the promotion piece as we go through it. And so, but going back to the, to the wit, here's kind of my point on that is, I assure you that females wearing ponytails the first time was not when someone submitted it to the wit. That probably has been a uniform board item for a while, would be my guess. Right? I'm not going to talk about beards, right? I'm just, I'm not. And I hope you don't have to talk about beards. If SimSaf wants to talk about beards at some point, she can, right? It, but I get asked all the time, what are we doing with beards? I'm shaving mine, 
right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not joking because that's the current policy. I don't know where we're going to go with that. And so you probably, as a chief, are going to get asked that question. What are we doing with beards, right? And, and no doubt it's something that was looked at and, and probably will continue to get looked at in the future. I don't know, right? And when it does, we'll, you know, if it's ever approved, we'll write a policy for it and we'll figure that out, right? But anyway, so lots of disparities, not lots, but some disparities, and that's what we've got to look at. We're looking at the assignment working group, right? And that's part of it, right? Is there any DNI issues in, in the promotion policy? We looked at that. Are there any DNI issues in the, the assignment policy? Who knows? We don't know until we take a look, but just know that we're looking at everything. All right, fitness. I want to talk about fitness a little bit. So I think Chief Olson mentioned it this morning, right? You're not as young as you used to be, right? Some of you stayed out a little late last night, didn't make it to the gym. Let me tell you, if you try to do the shuttle run without stretching and proper training, you are going to hurt yourself at our age. <laughs> and most of you are significantly younger than I am. But my point is, is fitness assessment changes. I know you guys are tracking that. We've been doing those for a few months now. Uh, what we are going to do in the A1 is we're going to gather the data and we're going to take a look at it, All right? Did we get the charts right? I'll be honest with you. That shuttle run or hammer run, that is no joke. You think 20 meters isn't that far? I said before, I'm 46 years old. To max it out, I have to do like 83. That seems like a lot to me. I don't think we got the charts right. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding, General Kelly, if you're listening. I'm kidding. No, we, we put a lot of, the team put a lot of effort into those charts, right? We had exercise physiologists. We used the human performance wing, right? We've got experts in the A1 staff that looked at that, right? And that's what we came up with. But my point is, is we made some adjustments, right? You can do the, the side crunches. You can do the plank. You can do the hammer run. But really what, what I think potentially could be happening is folks are looking at that 20 meter run and thinking it's pretty easy. And, and it's not. It's not easy. And so when you talk about the fitness assessment challenges, we're looking at the data, one, to see if we got the charts right, because I'll be honest with you in this crowd, right, family business, our failure rate's up. Our excellent rate is down. Now, I, I don't know if it's Two years with COVID, I don't know if it's the five years age brackets, and I don't know if it's people trying the different components and thinking that it's not that hard and then realizing it is. When we were doing this, there were people that actually suggested that you should do burpees for three minutes. <laughs> Have you ever tried that? <laughs> I'm not in the best shape, I'll admit that, but. I'm not even attempting burpees for three minutes, right? Burpees for a minute over here, who knows, right? But my point is we've got to figure out what's causing that, right? And everybody's got an opinion on, you know, COVID for two years, right? Whether it's the five years, whether it's the, you know, you name it, it's the new components. Bottom line is failure rates are up and excellent scores are down. And that's across the board, right? That's male and female. It varies for males and females on percentages, but but in some categories, it's doubled the failure rate. It's doubled. That's important to understand, right? And so I think we made some good changes on the fitness stuff. You know, we'll see as we, we look at the data over a six-month period and figure out if we got it right. Maybe at some point we'll add other components. I don't know. It's not much of a discussion right now. Uh, the walk was a discussion at some point. We removed the walk as an option for fitness component based off of you know, back in the day, and you guys, most of you weren't in, but when you used to bike test, you used to have the, the chest strap and you'd put it in the, you know, when you were done, you'd put it in the bleach water, regular water, you had gel all over you when you were done testing, right? It was, it was terrible. Uh, what did we do when we went to the new fitness program? We got rid of all that, right? And so we've got we've to create, you know, all of that. And now there's technology where you've got heart monitor on your wrist, right? You can wear your own stuff. We eventually may get there. I don't, I don't know, right? But at that point in time, the walk was said, we're going we're gonna to table this for right now. We're going to walk away from the walk, and we'll revisit it later once we can figure out kind of where we're at. But this is where we're sitting. Bottom line is, is understand that, that uh, there's some people that are struggling with fitness these days. And I, I would argue that COVID probably has something to do with that. Right? So look around your formations and have those conversations.
All right, body composition assessment. The SG community actually owns this. Uh, we have decoupled that, but I like to put it in our slides we, because we have a part in it, right? We have decoupled that from the fitness assessment. Years ago, you used to be able to go to your orderly room, right? You would do your height, your weight. They would put it in a chart, and they would say you're over 20% body fat, right? And then they would do a waist measurement, all, all of that good stuff, right, or whatever. Then we added that into the fitness component when we went to the new fitness program years ago. We added that in. However, it's been decoupled now, but it is a DOD requirement that you do body composition, you do BMI every year. And so the SG community who owns this took it and ran with it, and uh, they're going to come out with some stuff. And, and so we're going to go back to doing that. Where it's going to sit, that'll probably be at the commander level, right? Whether it'll be in the FSS, I don't know. Whether it'll be in the CSS, that's what we don't want is you don't do it when you do your fitness assessment. Because then that, in people's minds, put it, puts it in line with the fitness program. And it is not part of the fitness program. You are no longer scored on how big your waist is or how small your waist is. And so we had to decouple that. And we don't want you to do it at the same place and at the same time you do fitness. Because some people, whether you believe this or not, there are a lot of people that stress out about a fitness test. Any of you in here stress out about a fitness test? Yeah, and that's why we went away from it. You ever heard, you know, you hear about those people that do the preparation H and the, that's terrible. Terrible, and it doesn't work. I've tried it. <laughs> all right, I didn't. Anyway, all right, lastly, let me talk about some hot topics, and uh, then I want to spend some time getting some questions, and, and I'll go back to, as I said before, if I don't know the answer, I'll get you an answer. That's, that's what I promise you, every group that I talk to. I'm not an expert on everything. Our portfolio is absolutely huge. If I filled my brain with all this stuff, I couldn't do it. All right, hot topics. I've got about seven things I want to talk about. Continuation board. Let's talk about that. It's coming. I don't know when, but it's coming, right? We, no, we are looking at, in all seriousness, we are looking at a continuation board for chiefs. Anybody in here under 20 years? Who's under 20 years? Who's under 19? Who's under 18? 17? 16? 15? Well, you got to be at 14. I've studied that for years. 14 is the earliest you can make it. All right, so 15. He is golden. He can stay in the Air Force for another 15 years currently. Future state, you can stay in the Air Force 15 years if you're performing and progressing. Right? The days of, I made staff at six, I got a retirement, I'm hanging out for another 14. <laughs> right? We've known those people, you've known those people. Right? We're going to start with chiefs at some point. Right? I don't know what that looks like because, again, we've got to figure out some force management programs. We've done a lot of research on this with other services that do continuation boards. We've kind of figured out what the recommendation is on, on moving forward with continuation boards. Bottom line is folks have to perform in our Air Force. We are a lean force right now and getting leaner in future years. We need people that are performing and not just hanging around to get to 30. 30 is not a guarantee as a chief. 30 is not a guarantee as a chief. It can be if you're performing, right? But again, just want to share that with you, not to spook you, right? But really, you're going to have to have this conversation at some point, potentially, with your senior non-commissioned officers, because this may, in future years, move down to senior NCOs, right? We'll see how it goes. But I wanted you to know that in case you hear that, Right? In conversations with your command chief or your group chief or something like that, you've heard the phrase continuation board. Caregiver separation, this will be released no later than 1 April 2022. We've been working on this for a long time. All right? So caregiver separation, current policy is birth mother within the first year can make a decision and say, I want to separate early. I want to spend time with my family. 
I want to get out of the Air Force, be a stay-at-home parent. The secondary caregiver, this is mill-to-mill -mill couples, right? Mill-to-mill -mill couples. Starting there. It could grow, but we're starting there. Mill-to-mill -mill couples, right? The non-birth parent has never been given that option. What this is going to do is it's going to give that option to the secondary caregiver under an exception to policy program. We're going to start there again. We're going to see how this works, right? So if you're mill-to-mill, -mill, right, or you've got something like, uh, you may not be having kids, but some of you, one in your formation will. Currently, only the birth mother can separate, right? But maybe the birth mother's a tech sergeant, right? And maybe the secondary caregiver says, you know what? You like your job. I don't. Let me separate and stay at home. With, and families look different in 2022 than they did in 1987. They do. It looks different. And so we need to be able to adjust with that. And so we came up with caregiver separation. And so that's gonna, you're going to see some advertisement on that. It'll be officially released in uh, 1 April. We'll get it out uh, hopefully within that week, right, before 1 April. But then it's going to be effective at that moment in time. And so I think that's a good win to start. It is exception to policy right now, right, to, to do that, meaning if your career field's manned at 54%, it's going to be hard to say, yes, we can afford to let you go. Uh, but again, it's an exception to policy, and so I think there's some goodness in that one. Uh, we talked a little bit, or Mac did a little bit about the enlisted assignment working group. So this team has done some great work. They went through the 500 and some pages of the assignments, AFI. I think it's 518 pages. And then they gave us a document, and there are 37 pages of recommendations of what we can work on to make our assignment process better. And this was chiefs. Right at the command chief level, this was chiefs at the unit level, this was staff sergeants at the unit level, senior airmen. I think they had a couple officers on the program as well, even though we're only looking at enlisted assignments right now. 37 pages, I think there was a total of 96 recommendations. And so we're looking hard at it. What we have to figure out is what we can do right now, what we can do in the future, within the next year or two, and then what can we do long term, right? Because there's some stuff that you can do that's free. Then there's some stuff that costs little dollars, and then there, there's a third pile that's huge dollars, right? And so we've got, to, we've got to bucket them right there. And then we also have to figure out what are the priorities, right? And that all kind of ties into, you know, the, the managing talent piece. There's a lot of that. Uh, and some of this stuff is, you know, great recommendation. Some of it ties into what Blaze is doing with DSD. And so we're going to take some time next month or so. I think we have a meeting with SimSAF uh, the first part of March. To kind of get a vector from her on where we go with those 37 pages of 93 recommendations. So more to come on that, but just know that the, the team's looking at it. And then the last four things were in the NDAA. And then I want your questions. Bereavement leave. Okay, so many, a lot of folks don't realize bereavement leave is by law, right? So it's by law. People will say, well, we should get bereavement leave. It's by law. Good thing is now it's in the NDAA, right? So spouse or child is what was written in the NDAA non-chargeable for those with less than 30 days of leave. So I think that's goodness, right? That's a win. Now, if you've got 50 days of leave, it doesn't apply to you because the, it says non-chargeable for those with less than 30 days of leave, and it's for a spouse or a child. Now, I will tell you, everything in the NDAA, the Department of Defense has one year to implement that with policy. And so, you know, and I, and I say this because of of a topic down that's number three, right? Parental leave, 18 weeks and 12 weeks for secondary. People want that now. We do not get out in front of the Department of Defense, right? We do not get out in front of Department of Defense. They have a year to execute that in policy. And then at that point, the Air Force will create that policy. I want you to know what's coming because I am an information sharer. I want you to know. But when someone says, Chief, NDAA changed it, 18 weeks, I get it tomorrow. Your answer is, no, you don't, because the policy isn't out there yet. You've got to allow the Department of Defense to get their policy. You get the NDAA, and there's a lot of things that affect personnel programs in NDAA, and we will not get out in front of the Department of Defense, because we'll wait for their policy, and then we will move forward with ours. But bereavement leave is one of those. Parental leave is another one, up to 12 weeks for secondary. And here's another thing I want you to think about. This is a huge win. 18 weeks for primary, 12 weeks for secondary. How many of you think that's fantastic? You love it, right? Well, less hands than I thought. Okay. 
Maybe you're thinking what I'm thinking. I got two crew chiefs that are married. They have a baby. They both come to me as the chief and say, I'll be out for 18 weeks and my spouse will be out for 12. I think it's a huge win. But where I'm going to ask for your leadership in this, have conversations with folks. I don't know how many times you've had a conversation about leave when an airman comes to you and says, hey, chief so-and-so, I want to take leave next Tuesday. And you look at the calendar and you say, you know what, Crowder, we got a lot going on next Tuesday. Any way you can shift that to Wednesday? And I say, yeah, no problem. I'll take leave Wednesday. Right? I need you at work on Tuesday. It's a huge win. But understand that there's going to be a mission impact if we don't get out in front of that and have conversations with folks. You're going to have to have conversations, 18 weeks and 12 weeks, to lose two defenders, right? To lose two medics or a medic and a defender, a personnelist and a maintainer. I think it's a huge win. I think it's great. I love it. I love it. I took 14 days of leave 20 years ago when my daughter was born, and I took 14 days of leave 23 years ago when my son was born. The fact that we're getting 42 days, right? My math may be wrong on that. I think it is. But anyway, you get my point, right? <laughs> my math is wrong. You get my point. I think it's a huge win for our force. Where I need your leadership is to have those conversations and balance mission needs, right? And maybe you've got two seven-level specialists in the same AMU that are married, that have a kid, and you, you, you got to have that conversation and work it out to where, okay, take the 18 weeks, and then you go and take the 12 weeks after he or she comes back from the 18 weeks, right? Balance that. Balance that. Because another thing that's in our formation right now is, is you know, who can identify themselves as a, as a primary and secondary caregiver, right? If you have been on social media in the last week, you have seen articles and posts about this. And what's the answer to that question is who identifies who the primary caregiver is? The member. We need your leadership now more than ever. Your commanders need your leadership now more than ever. We have these conversations all the time when we're talking about leave. We need to have that conversation when we're talking about parental leave as well. And I'm happy to take a question on that if you need. And then lastly, I think this is a good, good win in the NDAA, is basic needs allowance, supplemental income for those with dependents that are less than 130% of the poverty guidelines. I've had a lot of discussions on food insecurities over my time in, in the A1 SELC. A lot of conversations about food insecurities. There was a task and purpose article that was on it. We did a first sergeant study through Diamond One Right, on food insecurities, meaning we have airmen in our formations that, that are struggling to feed their family. Some of you may not believe that. I, I don't know what percentage that is, right? I really don't. That's hard to get after. That right there, I think, helps. 130% less than the, right? Than less than poverty level. I think that makes a big difference. But anyway, with that, I got like 19 minutes for questions, I think. Are you on at 11.45, Mr. Brinkley? Okay. All right, go ahead. Hey, right to the microphones. James Carell, Joint Base Andrews. Uh, I have two questions for you. First one's on that last hour uh, on suicides. Uh, speaking from my airmen uh, on that are, are gun owners, and those locks came out, and we talk about 70% of those suicides are by gunshot, and the research shows that you know, within those five seconds, that decision's made. So we got to secure those weapons. Yep. Um, as a gun owner myself and as the airman, uh, we don't lock our guns with a lock, right? We put them in safes. Is there any type of, uh, um, you know, kind of programs where we talk to AFES or somebody to get like major discounts or something like that for safes, like when we actually put our, gun our, our guns in those safes? Because uh, as gun owners, we're not putting locks on on our weapons, like those locks were just put into the trash can. Well, please give them to somebody else before you throw them away. But yeah, I get hey, what you're saying. Everyone put them in the trash can. I get, I get what, what you're saying. You. Yep. Um, so I'll be honest with you, from an A1 perspective, the answer is no, uh, but I'm gonna write a note and I'm gonna send that note to the DECA command chief, not DECA, APHES. Sorry, I said DECA, but I'll send that to the APHES command chief. That falls in, 
in that lane more so. Um, I don't know what if there's anything that they can do, right? Because you've got AFES and, and DECA, and they are a um, you know for-profit organization. But I think that's actually probably a good idea. Is hey, if you're you know, I don't know how you work through that, but I'll absolutely take that not for the A1 action because that's out of our lane. But I'll shoot a note um, to the AFES command chief and see if that's an opportunity for them to to get after. I don't know. I don't know. If you have any thoughts on it? Go ahead. Second right, question. Chief, thanks. Uh, second question is for uh, the civilian bereavement uh, or the secondary caregiver. Um, that policy changed back in October of 2020, uh, where our civilian uh, teammates could could get secondary caregiver leave. Uh, has those codes been updated in the system to where that catches up on their pay? Because what I've uh, witnessed is for our civilians, uh, they had to put a code that is kind of a catch-all on their yeah. civilian leave, uh, and then the pay doesn't catch up, and they they kind of get docked or they don't receive pay for a couple weeks uh, and and have we caught up on the system uh, for our I'll, civilian members? To be honest with you, I'll have to check. I, I'm not tracking that that's been an issue. And so that me could mean that it's fixed, right? Or it's handled at the local, you know, CPO or, or FSS, but I'll, I'll take that for action fine now. I'm, no one's ever asked on the, on the codes and that's never been brought up. So I need to make sure that if it is an issue, uh, our folks are tracking it. So appreciate the questions. Who else? Go ahead. Keep talking. Start so this talking. This is a senior Aaron, Amanda Aaron from Kadena. So my question goes with the assignment. Um, we've done a lot of new things. We have the non-custodial parent uh, assignment process, which is awesome. Um, and in my career, I've never seen a revamp of the joint spouse assignment process. Um, and what I know is that we hand match every assignment. Uh, and we don't get to compete on the equal list or their overseas returnee list. And why, why have we not looked at uh, providing those bases of those hand matches ahead of the cycle versus you, plot, you wait for your assignment team to provide you yeah. an assignment? Yeah. No, that, I mean, that's, that's a very valid question on the actual execution of why we don't. Um, I mean, I can, I can speak from the Chiefs group perspective. Or from an AFPC perspective, I, I, I don't know why we don't do that, right? And, I, and um, I'm sure there's a very valid reason. But I will tell you that... Uh, joint spouse concerns are sprinkled through the 37 pages. And so we're absolutely uh, gonna take a look at that because there are concerns. And I, and I know from my time in the Chiefs group that, that joint spouse is, is, um, can be challenging. Uh, it can be really challenging if your joint spouse is guard and reserve. It can be very challenging if your joint spouse is a different service, right? And so all of those things, you know, from, from that lens of the Chiefs group is my experience with that. But, but I know that we are taking a look at it, and we're, we're going to look at that hard. Uh, we really are. We've got to make some changes to our assignments, and that's why SimSAF asked uh, the team to put together a working group and figure out how we can move forward to better manage the talent of our force uh, because we need to improve the way we do that. So great question, but we'll figure out how to get after it. Whoever. Chief uh, Senior Golf from Wright-Patterson. Uh, just a question uh, regarding my eval. Uh, you talked earlier about the force mechanisms with uh, feedbacks, things like that. I was curious, as this comes online, when you look at our in, uh, enlisted force distribution panels, as well as for senior NCOs, um, and obviously different wings have different stuff, but looking at like the strat packages, right, they go forward. Is there gonna be a mechanism in there that's a discussion to where units are not gonna have to print all these records or get everything out to where, whether it's the wing command chief or whomever for the EFDP, we can assign the board members so it's kinda all on digital so you can look at it without having to print and do? Yeah, that, that, that's a great point, and that's all part of the agile, right? Being able to do those types of things within that system, there are some challenges, I'm not gonna lie to you. There are challenges because currently um, you can go, I can go into arms, right, and I can print out my stuff. In my eval, I will be able to see my records, but who else will be able to see those records? And so we're having those conversations. Uh, I don't know that we're there yet. Uh, I'm a guy that I still print out every email, well, not every email, but a lot of emails that people send me. I like to read stuff on paper, that's, that's just me. I think there's opportunities to your point, to be able to do that, much like an e-boss or a testing, you know, something like that, just like they do, to be able to do those strat conversations. EFDP will be in my eval, right? What that looks like, the team is still working through that, right? But I think there's a lot of opportunity. 
Go ahead. You know, I only bring that up just because, uh, and currently we've just seen it, is as, as you all think through and A1 makes the policy changes, is even with our current EFTP right now, there are still some units that say, you know, the commander will say, hey, I've got three, you know, two must promotes and a promote now, so send me your top two from each of your sections, right, or each yeah. of your flights. So there's no force mechanism, even though the regulation currently says that every record will be looked at accordingly and meet the FTP accordingly. So that's why I was just curious, is it going to be the force to where it's making, you know, people actually have to look at the records if they're meeting their versus taking out the good old boy, right, or just saying, I'm yeah. going to send you my number one or number yeah. two. From my understanding on the EFTP, EFTP piece, that, that should work on that. Strats are a whole other thing, right, because we're still in the old strat process, and who even knows? You know, I've been, I've been around uh, a long time, and I've heard for probably the last seven years discussions and debates on do we keep strats, do we get rid of strats, you know, what do they look like in the future? And so, you know, who knows, you know, where are we even going to go with that? Uh, but the EFTP piece should do that, right? I know that that's, uh, they're wireframing the EFTP in there. Um, I'll make a note of that and make sure that there's going to be, if that's something that we need to do, we take a look at that, right? Versus your point of just send me your, your top one. We got a lot of records to look at. And then figuring out how do you look at the records within the system, right? And then another question on the, the my eval that I get a lot is, will we be able to pull the EPR out and send it to people, right? And so the answer to that is yes, uh, you will. Uh, but here's what I will tell you on my eval is a lot of, there's a lot of concern from, from folks out in the field on, on kind of what that looks like. And so what I would compare it to is, have you ever done a DTS voucher? Of course you have, you're a chief, right? Uh, you've done a DTS voucher. Have you ever printed out that DTS voucher? What does it look like? It looks nothing like what you filled into DTS, right? Kind of the same concept, right? TurboTax. Every year when I do my taxes, right, and I hit submit, and then I go to print, the tax form looks completely different than what was in the system, right? And so we've got to make sure that if you can print that out, we don't use the word form in A1H, right? It's digital data, right? Because that's what we're doing is digital data is what's stored in the system and pushed into your record. But if you want to print the form out, it would create a form that's an EPR, and that's what you would have. So just wanted to give you guys that. Go ahead. Good morning, Chief. I'm Good Senior morning. Hop from the Coast Guard Chief Petty Officer Academy. Uh, my question is this. The Coast Guard and other branches allow group study for their service-wide promotion testing. And while I'm not suggesting this for the 60 yeah. knowledge-based questions, is there initiative or any movement on allowing it for the situation-based especially with the rollout of the enlisted force development plan and building those team concepts in that frontline leader portions of it. Yeah, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been discussed, but again, when you talk about the ALQs, right? I mean, you're, 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 you're studying every day as an airman, right? When you're talking about ALQs, are you doing it for testing purposes? No, um, and so I think one, there's no discussion on allowing group study or anything like that. That hasn't been something that, that we've talked about with all the changes that, that are happening within the A1 community. And to be honest with you, I don't know if, if we use the, the ALQs right, as, as an opportunity to say, let's look at group study. And I don't know that that would make a difference because I think we're doing that every day. Because you should be talking to, your, to the airmen, right? You should be talking to junior NCOs about emotional intelligence. Now, what you can't do is bring somebody in that already took the test, you know what I mean? And so I think we still have to have that, that line, if you will, but uh, we may get to that at some point where we don't have any questions to where you're not studying. You just show up the day to test, right, and sit down, and it's situational because the true studying is happening every day when I, as your raider, are developing you, right? That's really the studying piece. And so, but, but as far as the group study, there's, there's nothing in discussion right now. All right, what else we got? Hey, I think I got good morning, eight Chief. minutes left. Uh, yeah. It's Sea Master Sergeant Dustin Hughes from uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. And my question is in regards to my eval as well. I'm wondering what uh, the agility looks like from the uh, CSS level versus MPF. So as we look at, as I think about my senior NCO core at Fort Gordon, right, I get it feedbacks in March. 
the majority of their supervisors are company grade officers that are summer movers. So we're going to be looking at reaccomplishing those feedbacks during the summer. So what does that CRO process look like? Will it be able to be handled at the local level? Um, or has that been thought through at this point? Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, so I mean, that's that's a great question where a lot of your commanders and, and company grade officers and stuff will rotate out in the summertime. And it's going to be agile enough that you can go in there. I can go in there every day and give you feedback, right? And then when the rater changes, what happens is, is when you do it in my eval, you can see the, the feedback and then the ratee, the rater and the ratee can both see that feedback in there. When the CRO is done, it automatically will change to the new rater, right? So when you're assigned a new rater of a new individual and it's May 14th, right? And you didn't give the feedback in March, you're automatically going to get that. Now, you won't see the feedback between the last raider, but it's going to be agile enough that at that moment in time, that day, when you go into my eval, you can do a feedback on that member. You can do one tomorrow as well. You can do it the day after if you want. There's no limitation on the amount of feedback that you can give members. Right? What we have ingrained in our mind is we do an initial and we do a midterm, and that's it. But in reality, you can do feedback as much as you want, and you have that opportunity in my eval. So I think it's going to be very agile when you're able to do that. What else? We've got six minutes. Go ahead. Sir, Senior Ennis from Aviano. Uh, along those same lines, looking at the feedback in the my eval system, um, if you're talking about performing the feedbacks and it's being limited to just the rater and rate is there going to be a report or some other way for uh, CSS Yep. supervisors, leadership to see what's being given as the feedback yep. um, to make sure it's an appropriate feedback. Uh, as an example, with the, cur <coughs> excuse me, with the current staff sergeant squads, uh, I've got members receiving less than ideal feedbacks and having to engage the raters and additional raters about the inadequate feedbacks. How so, would you be able to see that in the new system? So no. Um, yes and no. Yes to will the CSS be able to see feedbacks have been given. Will CSSs be able to see if it's an appropriate feedback? The answer is no. Feedback is conversation between rater and ratee. That does not change. That does not change. Now, what I will tell you is as leaders, right, you're here for a reason. But as leaders, that's our job to make sure our subordinates are giving appropriate feedback. You know, I'll be honest with you, I've been in wings where, where when you do EPRs, it was the command chief's policy that you submit a feedback with that EPR. I will fight that every single time and not make friends over it because feedback is private between the ratee and the rater, right? Where we are engaged as leaders, I don't need to get leadership involved, right, from a leader position to say you need to make sure that that they're getting right feedback. What I need to do is make sure that I, as a chief, am developing those senior master sergeants to develop the master sergeants, to develop the techs. You get where I'm going with that, right? So you'll be able to see in the CSS who's done feedbacks, where they're at, right? Red, green, yellow, stoplight chart, whatever the case is going to be, right? Whatever it's going to look like. But I do know that you're going to be able to know that, and you're going to be able to see that. But is it going to be appropriate? You know, I, I don't think so, because I still believe, and we still believe, as an Air Force, that feedback is private between Raider and T. Now, that's where relationships come in. That's where development comes in. That's where taking care of our, our you know, formations, that's where that comes in. So I, I don't know that we'll ever get there because feedback is not something that should be blasted all over social media. Go ahead, whoever, I think I got two more right here. Senior Thomas from Nellis. So we talk a lot about the ALQs and how everything is uh, going in page with promotion testing and, and that's how they're going to study. We're going to hand them this piece of paper. Uh, at the end of that, after they've taken the test, pass or fail, how does the supervisor know how they did in those particular instances to help them uh, to grow them better in those situations that they may have scored weak on, regardless if they got promoted or not? That, that Drop that mic right now. I mean, don't do it because they're expensive from 1987. But that's a very valid question. 
And to be honest with you, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if that's an opportunity uh, if, that we'll ever get to, right? One of the things that's been mentioned, and it kind of goes along with that, more so for the individual testing. And the reason I say this is because they're still working through all of that. Like, there's been a ton of changes and a lot more that are coming, and they're very detailed, right, when it comes to situational judgment testing. And so one of the things I got asked a couple weeks ago was, why can't, when you run it through the Scantron, I walk out of that testing room knowing that I got a 46 and I should try again next year. Or I got an 86, although I didn't get promoted, I know I got an 86. There's challenges with that because every year we throw out test questions, right? But is there opportunity, I'm big on using the word opportunity, is there opportunity to look at all of those things? Is there opportunity to give feedback to the rater on how well that member did just like we do on CDCs? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know where that falls in line with test compromise and those types of things. I don't know, but Mike, drop on that one. That's a fantastic question. I'll take that back and see if there's any discussion on that. I don't know the pros, the cons, right? I mean, we are in the development process, and this is a team sport in the A1 community. It's A1, it's AFPC, it's AETC, right? This is an absolute team sport in what we're doing, and we're trying to get it right. Er than where we're at right now, right? Hey, Chief. All right. Go ahead, and then we'll do, end with you right there, and I'll be done. Senior Reyes, Joy Pace Andrews. Um, I just want to address that question right there and also go back to one of your slides. Um, from what I understand, the SJTs, the only study material we have right now is not the ALQs, but the foundational competencies. Yep. And again, we could go back to the slide. I, we've been saying ALQs for these tests, but as I understand it, it's the foundational competencies. Now, how it's do we really know? kind of both. Good point. It's really kind of both. Okay. Um, yep. So how do we know how our, our airmen are um, adjusting to those foundational competencies? One way we could do that is it's, it's already in my vector. So they can take, and I've taken this assessment myself, and then it tells you where you're strong, your strengths and weaknesses. So that's one way we could see if they're prepared for those uh, SJT questions is for them to take the survey after they take the survey, they'll be given an opportunity to share that in a 360-style feedback so that they can send it to you as supervisors or their peers or people that work below them if they are uh, uh, senior or NCOs as well. So just want to put that out there, that the tools are out there for us to help them um, be prepared for these SJTs, and it is in the form of those foundational competencies, which we should all be taking as well. Over. Good point. And I started with that talking about you need to know the ALQs and you need to know your foundational competencies, right? That, that's what we're basing serving in our Air Force today. Competencies at the foundational level and those ALQs, right? And, and to be honest with you, the, if you want to eliminate stress of folks that are trying to study for this, there really isn't a way to study, right? It's situational. So here's the situation. How would you handle it? It's based on how you were brought up in the Air Force, how you were mentored, how you were trained, so on and so forth. All right, last one, I'll answer it really quick and then we'll go on break. Go ahead. Hello, Chief. Uh, Senior Parrish from Joint Base San Antonio. Uh, my question is in regards to just a, a concern when it comes to, of course, uh, changing of the promotion system, specifically going from where we had a, a more objective uh, test and, and WAP system to a very subjective uh, component and knowing that people inherently are biased. Uh, so how, here's a question, so how can we ensure that this process is transparent? Because of course when it comes to boards, EFTPs, uh, it's very convoluted and difficult to provide people feedback as far as why they got the score they got and what they can do better next year to be in a better position to get promoted. On your, on your eval, is that what you're talking about? I'm, I'm talking just in, toward, in regards to the board scores, in, in regards to the EFTP panels, et cetera. It, it, it comes down to it's very subjective and uh, difficult to give people specific feedback on what they can do to improve for next year to be uh, more competitive. Well, the, the EFTP piece, I will say, is, is, is I mean, we, we can call the boards and EFTP subjective, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that, but the EFTP piece is easy to get feedback. That's done at the local level. I mean, if, if, if you're going back to your unit and telling Airman Crowder that he didn't make the cut and that's the end of the conversation, folks in your unit are doing it wrong, right? 
Now the board piece, how we get feedback, we've never gotten feedback. We do the generic feedback, right? If, if you sat on a board, you can give the briefing and you could talk about those things. Uh, but understand too, the feedback, here's the challenge with that, and I'm not being negative about your question, I'm just saying there's a challenge because who sat on the board last year isn't gonna be there next year. And so you've seen this when you tell somebody, hey, I need you to go do this, and they go do that, and then next year at the EFDP, nobody cares about that thing you told them to go do, and they still don't get that marking, right? And so subjective, I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna say this and then I'm gonna walk off the stage, I'm gonna mic drop myself. Uh, you wanna give honest feedback on an evaluation, you decouple that from the promotion process altogether, right? You evaluate their performance. With that, thank you for your time, mic drop. I'll be here the rest of the day.